Hello, thanks for tuning in. My name's Sam Jones. I'm an R&D engineer at Powerfilm Solar. Uh, we provide custom solutions, uh, and a large part of our business is custom solutions for the IoT and for the sensing industries. Uh, we, we see the, the great potential in those areas. Um, it's definitely a, a growing part of our business. Um, and basically, to, to get us in the, in the right context of what we're going to talk about today, I'd like to ask a question, and that is, um, can you think of any electronics or, or any devices that actually do not require power to operate? Um, and if you really think hard about that, it, it, it may be difficult to even come up with even a couple. I mean, I, I think of RFID, um, but a, a, apart from that, you, you may come up with a couple, but, but in general, all electronics and all, all devices need power to operate. Um, and when you think about that, it really puts an emphasis on the importance of power and the importance of, of how devices get their power. And in that context, if you think about what is available as power solutions today, there's only two options. And being one being uh, batteries and the other being wall power and that really puts applications in, in this metaphoric box uh, it, it limits their their scalability both economically and functionally um, so the big question is I mean how do we step out of that box how do we how do we innovate to, to create those next generation IOT devices that are, that are able to, to overcome these these limitations and one of the one of the answers potentially could be this idea of energy harvesting. Um, so that's kind of what we're going to talk about today. We're going to um, answer these three questions. Uh, what is energy harvesting? Um, what can I power with energy harvesting? And how can I start prototyping today? So starting from the top, if we a very, very high level just in general, I mean, energy harvesting is sort of a buzzword. Um, and the, what people actually mean by that is there's, there's some sort of energy source in the environment. Um, and then there, there's some way that we can convert that energy into usable power. Uh, for example, we could have kinetic energy in the forms of vibrations in a car. And we can collect that and convert that energy using a, a piezoelectric material on maybe a cantilever beam structure. Uh, we could have heat energy from, say, uh, body heat. And we can convert that into usable power using a thermoelectric module. We could even have RF waves or from cell towers or TV broadcast towers or even a Wi-Fi router in your house. And there are antennas that are able to collect and convert that energy into usable power. Um, and then another common form and what we're going to focus on today is light energy. And that can be either from the sun or it can be from artificial sources like a light bulb indoors. Um, and we can convert and use that energy uh, with a, using a, a photovoltaic panel. Um, and although these energy sources and these conversion methods might look very similar, or very different actually, um, they, they have a couple things in common. Um, the first is that they're, they're low power. And, and when we say low power, uh, we're talking about milliwatts, microwatts, even nanowatts of power. Whereas if, if you look at around your house, some of the, the, app, the your household appliances, you may be talking in the, the watts or kilowatt range. Um, big power plants are in the megawatts and gigawatts range. So when we talk about low power, we're, we're, we're talking about very, very minuscule amounts of power. But this is matching and meeting a trend in modern electronics of ultra low power. So we have this conversion point where, where now it's actually feasible and practical to provide and run these devices from these minuscule power sources. And then the second idea is that an energy harvesting solution is in inherently application focused. And I mean, it has to be since it's relying on the environment to get power. Um, so that kind of makes you think about solutions in, in a different way. Uh, a conventional 
device maybe that's running off a battery, you wouldn't care if someone throws it in a desk drawer for a year, but if it's an energy harvesting solution, um, that could make a huge difference in, in the performance and operation of that device. So the second big question that we're, we're trying to figure out and trying to get a better understanding of is what can I actually power with solar harvesting? So there's this energy in the environment and we know that we can collect it and convert it, but what types of devices is that actually useful for? Um, so I'm going to try to answer this in a very, very tangible way through an example uh, with Bluetooth low energy. Bluetooth low energy can be extremely low power and is very well suited for and pairs very well with an energy harvesting solution. Um, so for example, let's say we have an LL200-337 indoor solar panel. This is one of PowerFilm's um, stock designs. You can go on DigiKey and buy it. Uh, and we're going to see what we can power with this panel at, at, in different locations um, and how that affects the operation of the device. So for, blue, for, for any application, um, the answer to this question is going to depend on three factors. Um, where that device is located in the environment, what the light level is, um, the device that you're trying to power, um, and then how that device is actually operating. And those three things are, are, are going to give you a rough idea of, of if your concept is actually going to work. Or it'll just give you an idea of what, what kind of is feasible. Um, so if we put this panel underneath a desk, we're going to have a really low amount of light. Uh, we're still going to be able to collect some power. And uh, our Bluetooth sensor can operate in a beacon mode. Um, we'll have enough power to update our sensors and, and connect to the hub maybe once an hour. If we take this panel and we put it on top of the desk, we'll get a little bit more power. And uh, we'll have, in general, enough power to, to establish an actual Bluetooth connection where we can update every maybe once per second. If we take the panel and we put it near a window, we'll get a lot more power. And we can update maybe 10 times a second. If we move outdoors, we're going to get even more power. And then we can look at, even in, in, the shade, in a shaded outdoor environment, we can look at powering more power intensive applications and configurations of Bluetooth, like a, a Bluetooth receiver or a Bluetooth hub. Uh, we may not have enough power to operate that at 100% duty cycle, uh, but we definitely could maybe look at some, some par partial operation, uh, maybe 10, 10 minutes out of the hour or, or something of that sort. Um, and then if I, if I place this panel in direct sunlight, I, I'll be able to collect enough energy throughout the day to run um, a Bluetooth hub or receiver or router in, in an always on configuration. Um, so that just gives you a really good idea of it's the same device, the same solar panel, and, and putting it in different locations, different environments, we're able to support a wide array of different ways that that device can operate, anywhere from updating once an hour to, to an always on mode. Um, and that's kind of the idea of a lot of these applications is they can be configured in a ver really wide array of, of power consumption modes and, and depending on your environment and your location, then and you can either support these or you may need to, to back off. Um, so kind of generalizing uh, an IoT solution, they, they usually have one, two, one or two or either of these parts. Um, usually they have a, a, some sort of a sensor module um, and then they have some way to transmit that data. So if we want to look at a general case and say what sort of sensors can we power um, with this same solar panel, and um, we'll keep the same categories of indoor, bright indoor, and then and then outdoor. In an indoor environment like a like a warehouse or an industrial plant, um, we'd be able to power sensors like temperature, humidity, contact, optical pressure, um, and then. devices that don't actually have a sensor on them or, or are operating in more of like a beacon mode um, are also going to be ultra low power and we can we can power those devices 
in really, really low light levels, and they're, they're inherently very low power. If we move into a, a brighter indoor environment, like a workstation or near a window, um, we can power things like inertial sensors or force sensors or low power displays or acoustic sensors. Um, and some of these sensors, they require more power because they, they have uh, sampling. So an inertial sensor, it may have to sample at a certain frequency in order to capture an event. So it, it's not able to shut down in between transmissions uh, into an ultra low power state. I mean, they, they, they can still be very low power, but because of that sampling nature, um, they, they do require a little bit more energy than, than say a temperature sensor. If we move on, on to a brighter outdoor environment, we're gonna get a lot more energy um, could be thousands of times more more power available and we can run things like video cameras uh, backlit displays um, so, uh, some higher power navigation systems and uh, Support those um, Maybe not in a hundred percent duty cycle, but in partial duty cycle um, and that kind of gets into the idea of this is this is just a generalized case um, I'm not telling you that you can't run a camera uh, off of solar in an indoor environment. Um, I'm actually the engineer, so it's my job to tell you that you can. Um, you just might need uh, a whole table's worth of solar, and, and it might only be able to operate for 30 seconds. Um, so, so it's not really you're not limited by by your environment. You're you can always find a solution, um, but, but it's, it's, it's my job to tell you that it's possible. It's your job to, to make the business case. So if we look at uh, wireless protocols, so this is how you transmit the data that you collect. Um, we have a lot of options that are, that are compatible with, with energy harvesting and, and all these wireless protocols like Bluetooth Low Energy, Zigbee, LoRa, I mean, even cellular can be configured in ultra low power modes, RFID, Z Wave. These protocols <clears throat> can be configured in a wide array and a very broad uh, configuration. So, so you can have an ultra low power configuration um, or you can have ultra high power configuration. And, and it really just depends on, on these three parameters. Um, data rate, sleep current or sleep power consumption, and then transmission time and transmission power. And you can probably have uh, an entire presentation series just on this single topic, so I'll try to keep it really high level and brief. Um, when we talk about data rate, we're, say we're saying how often the device is waking up to transmit data. So for Bluetooth, that can be anywhere from five milliseconds to 16 seconds and the power consumption and a lot of times is is linearly dependent on the data rate so if you are transmitting once per second and you back that off to two times or uh, once every two seconds your power consumption of your device may drop by a factor of two for sleep current we're talking about um, the what how the device is operating between transmissions and in modern electronics this is really the key that that has enabled energy harvesting solutions to become practical and I say that because these devices are able to almost completely shut down and operate in these ultra 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 low power modes um, drawing only microamps of current uh, between transmissions and then finally uh, transmission time and power, this is going to be the major difference between the different protocols. Um, so if you look at Bluetooth, uh, your transmission time may be uh, a couple milliseconds, whereas uh, cellular, it may take a couple seconds for you to connect, establish a connection and transmit your, your data. Um, and that, and that, that, that's a whole couple orders of magnitude that, that would affect in, that, you're, that you're operating at that high power mode. So, I mean, that's going to make a big difference in your overall power consumption. Um, cellular may require a couple watts of power to actually transmit that data, whereas Bluetooth may only require 30 milliwatts. 
an again, another uh, couple orders of magnitude there. Um, so the, these, these protocols can be widely configured in, into different power consumptions. Um, for the same amount of energy, a, a, a cellular solution may be able to update once an hour, whereas a Bluetooth solution, solution may be able to update once a minute. Hopefully by now you have some ideas floating around your head. And right now the idea is we take these ideas and, and, and now we, we want to do something with them. And the big question is, where do I start? And I would say that the best place to start is to get yourself the right tools. And the number one tool that you can get are, are development kits. Um, so the manufacturers of both the energy harvesting units and the, the wireless modules, the devices, they want to make it really easy for you to integrate their technology and their, their products into your solutions. So the way that they do that is by coming up with these development kits. Um, they do the hard work for you. And, and all you and, and make it very very plug and play and very drag and drop sort of um, development on your end. So so it just makes it very simple and very easy. And, and the same is with for energy harvesting. Um, it, it has a bad stigma of being overly complex and maybe just exists in some sort of lab setting, but the the opposite is is really true. And that's what. Power Films tried to do is come is say, hey, we have these development kits, and, and basically all you really need is a screwdriver, because we use screw terminals, and you can power your device through energy harvesting. So, for example, in the, in the diagram there, we have a solar panel, um, a battery, and then whatever low power electronics you're trying to power, you just screw everything together, and, and you're off and running. Um, so that just makes it incredibly simple and incredibly easy to, to test and experiment with an energy harvesting solution. Um, and then other useful tools may be uh, a light meter for, for a solar harvesting solution um, or a lux meter. And lux, if you're not familiar, is just a way, is a, is a standard, industry standard of, of measuring light level in an environment. Yeah, quite literally, it is the number of light rays that are entering your eyeball uh, per unit area. Um, and then lastly, I, I say a voltmeter or a multimeter. And that's just really useful for, for measuring things like battery level that we'll, we'll go over in a second. Um, or just really basic circuit troubleshooting to see if there's voltage across your uh, solar panel or it can it can get really really simple you don't have to get fancy just this kind of really simple ways that you can see if your circuits operating and without banging your head against the wall so there's a lot of development kits out there and how do you choose the right one for your application um, basically there's there's two schools of thought the the first is if you are kind of in your early stages of development, um, say maybe you, you bought a development kit from someone like Nordic or someone like Texas Instruments or, or whatever device you're trying to operate and you want to see, that, that, that's a really good time to try to see if it, solar harvesting is uh, a good fit for you or for energy harvesting in general. Um, so the first thing I would do is dive into that device's data sheet. And, and that'll tell you a lot about what sort of power requirements that needs in order to operate. Uh, we've done a lot of, of solutions with, with Nordic Semiconductor. Um, this is a data sheet for one of their Bluetooth modules. Um, and if you go a couple pages down, you'll come across a table that reads recommended operating conditions. And at the top there, you see supply voltage, uh, 1.7 to 3.6 volts. So this part, can operate um, if you feed it anywhere from 1.7 to 3.6 volts. Um, and that, that sort of range is really common for microcontrollers and wireless chips. And it's, that's actually very beneficial to an energy harvesting solution because that really opens the door for some, some really simple and elegant uh, energy harvesting circuit, circuitry solutions that we will I'll kind of briefly go over at the, towards the end of this presentation. But yeah, so you basically want to match the power requirements that you see in the data sheet to the power 
provided by whatever dev kit that you find. Um, so for this example, three volts is really common output for a lot of the development kits available, um, including the, the development kits that, that PowerFilm offers. So you would be able to just connect your uh, power supply of your develop of the, the device directly to the output of the development kit and you'd be ready to go. The second school of thought would be what if you already have a product or you're kind of in the later stages of de the development process uh, what do you what do you do then um, and I would say you look at the current power source of the device um, so maybe that's a battery maybe that's a, a USB cable um, and that'll tell you a lot about what sort of power requirements that device has. <clears throat> so at the far left, you have a little rechargeable lithium polymer battery. Um, and that's good news for you if your device is running off of that because a lot of the development kits come with a pre-configured lithium battery charger. So you would just be able to hook your battery up to the battery charger and then, and then it would still be able and then hook it in parallel to your device and you'd be able to to test it and charge your battery that way. Next over we got a, a lithium primary button cell. This is probably the most popular battery in IoT devices and you're also in luck if your device has this battery because like I said before a lot of development kits offer that 3 volt output um, and you can hook hook your, your device directly to that output and, and then you're ready to go. Um, a lot of devices run off alkaline cells, so if you have one, two, or three alkaline cells in series, uh, you're under that under five volts, so you'll, pro you'll most likely be able to find a development kit with, uh, with an output in that range, um, so you'll be able to, to hook up your device to that output and, and be ready to go as well. The last two, um, if you're running a, a 9 volt battery or a, a 9 volt, 12 volt, or 15 volt barrel connector, um, sort of that higher voltage regime, you're, you're going to have more of a difficult time finding a, a compatible development kit. Most development kits are only support voltages below that 5 volt range. Um, but you're not completely out of luck. There, there's definitely still energy harvesting solutions available. You might just need to uh, put your engineering hat on um, or, or contact me. I'd love to help you design and develop a, a higher voltage um, energy harvesting uh, solution. It, it just may require a little bit uh, more of a, a custom circuit or, or looking a little bit closer at the, the exact power needs of your device. So you have a device, you have all the tools that you need in order to get that device up and running on solar harvesting. Um, it may look a little bit Frankenstein-y with wires going everywhere, but but now is, is the time where you can move on to the, more of the proof of concept stage. Um, quite literally, you could, you could tape your device to the wall just to start collecting data. And the concept, the fundamental concept that we're trying to prove with an energy harvesting solution is that we can actually produce enough power that we need. We can produce the power that we need. And that doesn't necessarily mean that we're producing more power than we're consuming. A lot of energy harvesting solutions and a lot of customers we work with are only trying to extend their battery life. I mean, and sometimes uh, their battery life may be six months and they want it to be two years. Um, so we just need to provide enough power to supplement that battery and, and extend that battery life. Um, so how do we how do we do that? How do we prove that concept? Uh, we measure and monitor the power consumption of the device, um, and you can get really fancy here with data loggers and track and, and and logging the current and voltage over time. But but you can be really simple as well. I'll, it could be as simple as just measuring the the battery voltage once a day or once an hour or every couple days. Um, and, and then tracking that battery level over time. Um, and then once we start collecting that data, <clears throat> we can make informed decisions and then we can make adjustments to our design. So say our, our battery level is falling over time or it's, it's falling faster than, than we would like, um, then we can do things like, like look at 
um, we can make adjustments. And um, if you haven't been to church for a while, uh, here's your opportunity. I'm going to preach to you a little bit. I would highly recommend looking at your device first when you're making adjustments uh, versus looking at the energy harvesting solution. I mean, we'll, we'll look at both, but I would say, and, and there's a couple reasons for that. Um, the first is that, like I said before, when I was talking about wireless protocols, your, your power consumption is a lot of times linearly dependent on your data rate. Um, so if you're, you're looking at your solution and it's consuming too much power, uh, maybe ask yourself, do I really need to update that frequently? Um, is, it, is it going to be critical to my application if I update every two seconds versus updating every one second? Um, and, then, and then backing off to whatever that, that uh, worst case or, or, ma or minimum frequency is, and that'll be, that, that, that can often greatly impact the, the power consumption of your device. And then secondly, these development kits, reference designs, sample code that you might get from a manufacturer, I mean, these are all packed with features. And every, and every feature that is included in, in these reference designs and, and development kits comes with a, a power cost. So you want to go through your design and say, are there features that are drawing power that I can potentially disable? Um, a great example of this is we were, I was working with a customer and their device was functioning, it was, it was working great, but the sleep current was, was way too high. Um, it was 200 microamps. And for the te technology that they were using, I knew that that sleep current could be much lower. And it was really preventing that solution from being feasible. We would have needed a, a panel the size of a table in order to supplement that much power. So we were banging our heads against the wall, we, and then we, we started looking through the, their software, their code, and we came across a line that read log enabled equals true. And when we changed that one word from true to false, so we disabled the, the logging feature, the, the sleep current of that device dropped from 200 microamps to 2 microamps, a factor of 100. And for that particular design, the, the power consumption was really heavily dependent on the sleep current. So our overall power consumption dropped by about that same factor. So all of a sudden, we, we went from ha needing a pa panel the size of a table to a panel the size of an index card. So we, that, by changing that simple, simply changing that one word, we, that design became, that, that energy harvesting solution became practical and feasible. And we would have been banging our heads for, for a really long time trying to figure out how we could collect and or produce the power that, that was needed to, to power that device when all we really needed to do was, was disable that logging feature. So if you look at your device and you're, you're convinced that it's operating in its very optimal low power mode, then we can start looking at the energy harvesting solution and saying how can we maybe change our environment or we can change the the solution itself we could increase or decrease the size of the solar panel um, to better fit uh, the data that we've been collecting um, so that might be um, changing the mounting of the panel um, maybe you're, you're horizontally mounting it uh, maybe you could try vertically mounting it or, or mounting it at, at a 45 degree angle and that could in a lot of situations that could change the power con power production of that panel um, maybe you need to change your environment or your worst case environment maybe you don't need maybe it's okay if the device is, is able to not able to operate underneath the table if it's maybe your worst case could be on top of the table and that can also have a huge impact on 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 the design and and the argument for 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 proving your concept so up until this point, you don't need to have a degree in engineering. You don't have to have a degree in physics uh, in order to get the right tools, have a device, and prove a concept. I mean, you can you can have an idea and you can you can go through all these steps and actually prove that concept without doing much design work at all. Um, and that's that's a powerful thing. I mean, once you have a concept and once you say, this, I know that this works, 
then you can go and you can convince people to to get behind you and maybe maybe then you can get the resources you need to actually implement this this idea and this concept into a real product so the next thing I'm going to talk about is is what does a final product actually look like um, I mean the, the the thing you got taped on the wall I mean that that's great for for proving your concept but it definitely isn't something that you're going to sell to a customer um, and maybe that that development kit is has a lot of circuitry and stuff and features that you don't really need that you could remove and and save some cost and maybe maybe that will make your business case more uh, practical um, so so when I think of a final product I think of two things I think of how does it function so functionally it needs to work the way that you want and then secondly economically it has to be able to, to match whatever business case you're trying to, to, to prove so from an energy harvesting perspective um, this is where you start to explore what circuit options you need. Um, so so when we, for solar harvesting, that can be anywhere from super simple to, I would call it smart. Or, I mean, it's, it's more complex, but I like the word smart. And basically, the, the, cir the right circuitry that you need is going to depend on what features you need. Um, so this is an example of, of the simplest circuit that you could have for an energy harvesting solar solution. It's two components, a capacitor and a diode. The, the solar will charge the capacitor, and then the load will draw energy from that capacitor when there's, when there's light available. And then when it, it's dark, the, the diode will prevent the capacitor from discharging back through the solar. Um, so this circuit can work in a lot of applications, and it, it's, it's incredibly sm small. There's only two components, incredibly low cost, so it's great for your business case. Um, the problem is that it doesn't really have any features. So for a lot of IoT solutions, a lot of microcontrollers and wireless devices, uh, they have this problem where when they try to turn on, they draw a bunch of power. And that'll, that'll tank the, the voltage of your capacitor so much that the device then has to turn off and then try to turn on again when it tries to turn on again it'll tank your capacitor again and you get stuck in this what what I call a, a turn on loop and it's a really big problem and, and it, it prevents circuits like this from from working in a, a larger array of a, a broader um, generalized fashion uh, a simple way that we can modify this circuit to be applicable to a really wide range of devices is to piggyback off of a primary battery. Um, so a lot of devices, 99.9% .9 of devices, already have a primary battery in them. So you could simply add these three components and your device in certain situations could extend the battery life indefinitely. Uh, so the solar will charge the capacitor up above the primary battery and then as long as there's energy available the load will draw from the capacitor instead of your primary battery and then maybe if you're in the dark too long the the load can can draw power from that primary battery as as a backup and this circuit is is very applicable to a really wide range of devices and can be used to again very low cost very small footprint Here's an intermediate circuit. Uh, this solves that, that problem I was talking about of the turn on loop. It has a couple comparators, a couple switches. Um, and what it's able to do is, is disconnect the load at those low voltage levels. And then until the solar can charge the capacitor or the battery up to a, a level where it knows that it that has enough energy to turn that load on. So we call that low voltage disconnect uh, with hysteresis. Um, a second function that this circuit has is what we call high voltage charge termination. So if you remember back to that Nordic data sheet that we, we saw, it had an upper range or an upper limit of 3.6 volts. Um, so for a solar panel and a lot of other energy harvesting sources, the, the voltage is really variable and it'll change based on how much power you're drawing on it. Um, and for a solar panel, that could be double of, of what, of what you're, you're pulling. Um, 
So if you're not pulling any power from your solar panel, that voltage may float up past what the maximum of your device allows. So you need some sort of circuitry in there that's able to disconnect that solar panel from your, from your circuit. And that's exactly what this circuit does. Still quite a quite, um, low number of components compared to um, a smart circuit and, and lower cost. There, there's, no, there's no ICs here. And what I didn't mention for the previous circuit that I'll, I'll mention here is that since we are sort of directly charging the, a capacitor or a battery from our solar panel, it, it can be very, very high performance. Even higher performance than what you would see for a smart um, power management IC solution. So then finally we get to more of a, a smart solution. Um, so this is... Uh, Texas Instruments BQ25570. It's an energy harvesting and power management chip. It's able to, uh, has a lot, uh, uh, several features that, that make it really easy to implement in a design. And that's, we use this chip for our development kits. And this is what, these types of chips are what you're gonna see in a lot of the development kits that you find. Um, they just have a lot of features that make it easy to prototype and easy to power things with an energy harvesting uh, source. Um, some of the features that this chip has is an adjustable battery with, with a, a, an adjustable battery charger. Um, it also has a regulated power output uh, so that you can provide power to your, your circuitry. And then a big thing that these, these chips have our, our max PowerPoint tracking or, or input regulation. And that's not as important for, for solar harvesting, but it can be really important for other forms of energy harvesting that really need that, that regulated input, that need to be held at their PowerPoint in order to collect energy. Or if their voltage is too low, a lot of these chips are able to, to take that really low voltage and boost it up to a more usable voltage or to charge a battery. Um, and then th these circuits are also high performance. Um, that you might be having a little bit of a deja vu, but my I wanted to emphasize the point that just because your, your circuit is smarter, um, you have a, a complex circuit that has all these fancy parts on it, doesn't mean that it's going to be higher performance than a simpler circuit. Um, and actually, for, for a solar harvesting solution, the opposite is true, where simpler circuits often outperform these, these smarter uh, energy harvesting chip solutions. Um, so for, for, for our customers that are, that are looking at solar harvesting solutions, I would usually always recommend either the, the intermediate circuit or the simple circuit versus this smarter circuit, um, unless you need one of the features that it provides. So again, this, the, right, the correct circuitry uh, for, for your application really depends on the features that you need. So to summarize, we kind of got an idea of, of what, we're, what we're talking about when we say energy harvesting we have a better understanding of reality of, of what sort of devices we can actually power with with the energy that's available in the environment um, and then the really big question and, and the what I want you to be able to do after you leave or after after you are finished listening to this is how can you start prototyping today um, and here's my three-step process identify a device identify the tools needed i.e. development kits, um, and then assemble, deploy, and then prove your concept. And, and really to do this, these three steps, you don't really need to be or have a technical background. All you need to do is be able to, to identify the right tools and to put everything together. Uh, it's the manufacturer's job of these devices and of these energy harvesting sources to make it easy for you to do that. Um, that's my job is just to try to make it easy for you to, to, to experiment and prototype with our solar panels. Uh, I'd encourage you to go onto our website. We have more information. We have uh, demo videos of, of things being powered using our de development kits. 
more information that you might need. I mean, if you have an idea or if you have a concept and, and you're thinking maybe solar harvesting is, is a great solution for that idea, I'd really encourage you to contact us and reach out. And we would love to work with you and, and kind of go over your your concept, work through your, your application and see if solar harvesting can actually be a great solution for you.